All right, students, thanks for tuning in. Let's take a look at stratospheric ozone depletion. A little review of our one X. So first question, the ozone layer protects life on Earth by absorbing which of the following rays from the sun? Multiple choice. All right, so if you picked ultraviolet B, that is correct. Ultraviolet A is less harmful, it is not absorbed. Ultraviolet C is more harmful, it is not absorbed. Um, only ultraviolet B, which is harmful and absorbed. Which of the following is true about ozone? Multiple mark. Go ahead and make your choice. Okay, so if you picked B and C, you're correct. Ozone in the troposphere is bad. It is a tissue irritant present in photochemical smog. And ozone in the stratosphere is good. It absorbs UVB rays. It is made from sunlight reacting with O2 to make O3. So some details here. It's not really a layer, but a region of higher than normal ozone concentrations. It's 17 to 30 kilometers up, which is something like uh, 10 to 20 miles up. It absorbs UVB radiation, and this is important for two big reasons. UVB is high energy, so it can mutate DNA, causing increased skin cancer. And it also can kill oceanic phytoplankton, or algae, which are responsible for doing 75% of the world's photosynthesis. It forms naturally by the following reactions, and you should know these. O2 plus UV from the sunlight. This UV is enough to be able to break up an O2 molecule, so now we have O and O atoms. One of those O atoms can combine with an O2 molecule to form O3 ozone. It is depleted by chlorofluorocarbons. Here are two examples. First one is called freon-11, second one is called freon-12. You'll notice that they are carbon-based molecules. In the middle, you have a carbon, and then we have some fluorines and some chlorines. And depending on the ratio of them, we have different names for them. These are both used as refrigerants in refrigerators and air conditioning units. And they are mass produced by industry. Okay, you can go ahead and read that if you'd like, but you should know, I guess, two main things. Refrigerators and air conditioners and spray paints, hairspray, and other aerosol spray consumer products. We don't use that anymore. We still use, we still have refrigerators that are running on Freon and air conditioners like the one in my car. However, in the 80s, we stopped using them for spray paint. However, some of those old cans might be sitting in a landfill and slowly outgassing. Some old refrigerators are also sitting in landfills or elsewhere and slowly um, emitting their Freon into the atmosphere. So when we take refrigerators um, to the dump, they are required to suck out and capture the Freon before they actually dispose them. So here's a picture of the, this is um, a satellite image of the ozone layer at its worst. In the end of winter, remember this is winter in the southern hemisphere, so it's opposite from the northern hemisphere, in 2006. And um, why is the hole usually over the Antarctica? It's because there's an annual polar air vortex. And this vortex concentrates ozone-depleting chlorine atoms and prevents replacement ozone from coming in from elsewhere. On a global average, however, the ozone layer is about 15% thinner than it used to be, hence the need to be more careful about sun exposure. And this image is from NASA.gov, and here it's showing a ozone layer that's 70% thinner than normal. That got kind of cut off. How CFCs deplete the ozone? All right, you guys are pretty good at this um, now that you've done the ozone one x But um, take a look at this, study it, or you can read my description on here if you want to. I want to point out that this chlorine, chlorine atom can go around and destroy multiple ozone molecules. In fact, it can do this for thousands of times. Here's the basic chemical reaction for that. One chlorine atom combines with one ozone, it pulls away one of the oxygens to form chlorine oxide, and it leaves behind regular oxygen. That chlorine oxide can then combine with another oxygen molecule, or oxygen atom, to form free chlorine atom plus um, oxygen. And this chlorine can then go back and start the process again. Quiz yourself. The Antarctic ozone layer is thinnest at the end of what season in the Southern Hemisphere? Did you say winter? That is true. Because in winter, you have a lack of sunlight, 
which has slowed ozone regeneration, and the polar vortex clouds have concentrated ozone-depleting chlorine atoms. When the sunlight returns in spring, that's when the ozone layer is at its worst, but the sunlight begins to help regenerate ozone. We see these fluctuations here. And so this is um, March, which would be the end of summer. It's at its best. And then we have September, which is normally the end of our summer, but in the Southern Hemisphere, it's the end of winter. And here the ozone layer is at its thinnest. So here's a summary of that. And in the winter, not only do we have the, um, the vortex, which keeps the chlorine atoms swarming around and prevents fresh ozone from being brought in, but you also don't have sunlight, so you're not having the UV rays necessary to make new ozone. Which of the following was a policy or law designed to reduce the presence of CFCs in the atmosphere? Multiple choice. I think you guys all know this by now, Montreal Protocol. And this is what happened. 180 nations signed this protocol which restricted CFC production globally. It didn't end production, but it restricted it to only being used for things like refrigerators that are already designed to work with those chemicals. And so you need to keep making them in case the refrigerator breaks and it needs more of it. And um, there are some other follow-up agreements, but today the good news, CFC levels are down and stratospheric ozone is starting to recover. Full recovery is not expected until mid-century. Many CFCs are still contained in their products and haven't yet been released, and many are on their slow journey to the stratosphere. So even though we've stopped producing CFCs, and CFC, um, yeah, CFCs going into the atmosphere are lower, it takes a while for that effect to be seen in the stratosphere. The Montreal Protocol is one of the biggest environmental success stories of our time, and we have apparently avoided a major environmental problem we, we talk about a lot of problems in environmental science. This is one that was solved through science and through awareness, and most importantly, through politicians and diplomats coming together to make agreements. And it was a kind of an easy case though, in some way, because we did find some pretty suitable replacements for the Freon. We use different gases now in spray paints, although Freon does make a pretty killer refrigerant. All right, so, um, Let's see here. Yeah, that's basically what we just talked about. 